Electricity and water do not normally mix, except when you're trying to explain it. This device is called a Shishi Odoshi, a Japanese invention that makes a tapping noise originally to scare away deer, away from eating crops. Although it's also become a water feature popular in Japanese gardens. How does it work? The Japanese made theirs from bamboo. I've made one from bits and pieces I had lying around, including part of a hand cart, a screwdriver, a bit of a TV antenna, and some water pipe. The pipe is on a pivot and swings like this. A screwdriver is used as the support, and the bottom of the pipe is plugged up. This is the screwdriver used as the pivot just off center of the pipe. This is an element from a TV antenna that's used so that the pipe in its resting position is just off vertical. And you can see here, I've sawed the pipe diagonally so there's a spout. The idea is that this fills up with water. When the level of the water rises, eventually it tips the pipe like that. That causes the water to trickle out, which lessens the mass of water in the pipe, and therefore the weight of water that causes this to unbalance. So it then goes to its erect position. The water is still coming from the hose, so the pipe gets another fill, and again, goes like this, so you've got a motion like this, tapping on and off as the pipe fills, empties, then refills. If you have the bamboo brushing up against a stone, then it can make a tapping noise. Provided everything's aligned, this goes on indefinitely. You could argue that this thing is the water equivalent of an oscillator. It's almost like there's feedback. It gets to a certain point, a certain amount of water is in, and then that causes a change that causes it to snap back to its original position and it fills again and the cycle repeats. If you're interested, and this would be a great science experiment, or even item for the garden, then look it up on YouTube. There are many described and demonstrated. You could argue that the electrical equivalent is this relay circuit. Imagine the DC power as the water supply and the relay's coil as the pipe that fills up with water. Connected between the DC power and the coil are these switch contacts. These are the contacts that are switched by the relay when it is energised. This is an unusual way of connecting the relay. Circuits wouldn't normally be wired like this, but we've got the contact which is the normally closed contact connected to the relay's coil and the common contact which is in the middle 
connected to the power supply. Because these contacts are closed when the relay is unenergized, as soon as you apply power, the relay energizes. Then the contacts change so that the closed contacts become open. As soon as that happens and the relay cuts out, then these contacts are shorted again, providing power to the relay. So it's like a clicking on and off, pulling in and pulling out as these contacts open and close. It's a similar parallel to what you saw with the water, with the pipe going backward and forward. The act of filling up the pipe caused enough weight in it to move the pipe so that it moved it away from the water supply that drained the water out and then the weight of the lower part of the pipe caused the pipe to swing back towards the incoming water so it would again go backwards and forwards. So a roughly similar concept with this relay circuit. Effectively a crude oscillator. Here is my mock-up of the relay circuit. This is the relay, it's about three centimeters square and a 12 volt automotive type relay. And just here out of the picture is a 12 volt seven amp hour battery. Plus I've added a series resistor, 8.2 ohm. That's optional, but it limits the current going through. Now connecting the power. You can hear the relay oscillating. Relays aren't designed to handle such abuse, so it will probably wear out if you have this on for too much. Right next to the relay, I've got this AM radio. I've got the volume turned up. It's in between stations and we'll just apply power and see what happens. The arcing on the relay contacts is creating RF, which is picked up on this radio. What we have made is a crude spark transmitter, just like used in the early days of radio. Now, something else. <laughs> Tuning across the radio and you hear the spark all across the dial. That's another limitation of the very first spark transmitters. They didn't operate on any specific frequency and they put out RF all over the spectrum. One of the early problems identified and then solved with radio was to put in a tuned circuit so you'd then concentrate the signals on specific frequencies. That would then allow multiple transmitters to operate at once. Pretty much the sharpest tuned circuit you're likely to find is something like this magnetic loop antenna. Magnetic loops are generally a short across the feed line. That's because they're fed either with a smaller inner loop around a fifth of the diameter of the larger loop or with a gamma match type arrangement like mine. So because it's a short circuit, I'll put it right in the series connection of this relay. I'm just using some adapters here. This one is a BNC to two binding posts. If you've got an oscilloscope, you'll most likely have one of these adapters. Anyway, I've got the receiver here on seven megahertz, a bit above seven megahertz. <laughs> can see that as we tune through 7 megahertz there's a pronounced peak hence hence we've succeeded in making a spark transmitter that confines its frequency to a somewhat narrow band This is our look at a crude spark transmitter. Not of any practical use, 
except possibly for educational and demonstration purposes. It shows how you could do things even before the advent of components for amplified signals. And I thought the parallel with Japanese water-powered deer-scaring machines was interesting.